Now, you may be getting the impression that we weren't taking our mission as seriously as it warranted, and anyone from the other teams would have certainly said so. There's a difference between not being serious and not being effective, though, and we fully intended to complete the objectives we'd set for ourselves. Since, in our eyes, our main job was to be ready to save the other team's bacon, everyone stayed within sprinting distance of the shuttle, and Jim kept its engines warmed up. In defenses to the fact that this was potentially hostile territory, everyone outside the shuttle stuck in groups, and Twitch worked with Jim to set up a rudimentary perimeter around the LZ. Finally, Spot the Wonder Drone was feeding everything it saw to our adepts, and we were definitely keeping our eyes open as we strolled around the beach and inspected all of the bungalows. Admittedly, Nubby was the one doing most of the inspecting, but it's not like anyone expected us to find anything anyway. Sarge picked through a few beach chairs until he found one that didn't have a big, vaguely human-shaped hole in it and made himself comfortable. He lounged in the sun and listened to the other team's comm traffic. From the sound of it, Battle Axe had already spotted the silhouettes and didn't need to be pointed towards them. The burly non-com laid back and idly watched as Twitch built some truly impressive sandcastles. Jim elected to stay in the shuttle, claiming that sand was bad for his metal bits, but sent out a few servo skulls and chatted with Tink over the comms. The techie had yanked off the two Grox skulls his drone had been encased in, and was nauseating the adepts trying to watch the video feed by racing it against Jim's skulls. When they started arguing over whether ramming was allowed and if busting through walls counted as a penalty, Sarge made them switch to hide-and-seek. While everyone else stayed near the shuttle, Nubby grabbed fumbles and went to do an exhaustive search of the nearby buildings. At first, it was for small and valuable items that might need a new home, but after a while, Nubby realized that he was being unprofessional. A few minutes later, he and Fumbles had acquired a wheelbarrow and switched to searching for large and valuable items that might need a new home. Fumbles happily pushed the barrow and learned several important lessons about the difference between looting and recycling. Everything was going splendidly, and Sarge was considering taking a nap when Twitch screamed, Movement! and dove into a freshly dug sand trench. Despite the amount of shit the rest of us gave Twitch over his paranoia, we all trusted his spotting skills with our lives. Within seconds, Sarge and Tink landed in the trench next to him, and overhead the drone engaged its stealth field. On the far side of the shuttle, Nubby and Fumbles dropped their loot, and got ready to either flank or sprint to safety. The only person who didn't respond immediately was Jim, who poked his head out the shuttle's door to see what the fuss was about. Sarge screamed at the cog boy to get back into cover, and drove the point home by chucking a nearby entrenching tool at the open hatch. The shovel barely missed Jim's head, and he scrambled back with a little yelp, while the rest of us tried to spot whatever Twitch had seen. When nothing happened over the next few minutes, Sarge started ordering Tink, Jim, and Fumbles to scan the area. Before he managed to finish the order, a buzzing voice cut in and told us to remain in your current position and cease communication. Your vessel will be yielded to our service. Everyone pegged the voice as a tech priest of some variety. Anyone else with an augmetic voice box would have at least tried to make it sound normal. This guy sounded like a cross between a garbage disposal and an opera singer. Everyone was still processing this development when Tink's knee-jerk response kicked in and he screamed, Jam it up your metal ass, techno-fascist! into his combied. Instead of an explosion of angry binary or an immediate attack, the awkward silence was broken by a second voice exploding into laughter. It wasn't exactly happy laughter. It had a definite hysterical edge to it, and went on for far longer than Tink's comment warranted. 
As we sat and waited for it to peter out, Sarge cut his comm and asked Twitch if he'd recognized the voice. Both of them agreed that the speaker was female and someone they'd met before, but couldn't pin it down. Sarge was on the edge of interrupting and asking for some identification when the tech priest commanded the woman to cease her frivolity. This did not go over well. You know how some people argue like an old married couple, and it's sort of cute to watch? Well, this wasn't anything like that. They argued like, well, two people who'd been stuck on a deserted island together for far too long. Or one person and a damaged blender. It wasn't just awkward to listen to, it was actually a little scary. Weeks or months of pent-up venom poured out in a nearly incomprehensible tirade from the woman and the priest countered with commands for silence and bursts of binary. It only got harder to listen to when the cogboy cut his comm and she left hers on. Now that she was talking, most of the rest of us recognized the woman's voice, and at Sarge's order, we followed the sounds of the argument. After a few blocks of walking, we found a familiar guardswoman, face gone crimson, screaming at a senior-looking tech priest. They were standing in the middle of a half-looted convenience store, with a half a dozen servitors forming a menacing-looking ring around the woman. Nubby and Twitch grabbed Tink before he could say anything stupid, and Sarge awkwardly cleared his throat. To everyone's surprise, especially Sarge's, the argument came to a sudden halt. Our fearless leader was nearly knocked off his feet when the guardswoman screamed his name and tackled him. Nubby took a picture. While being tackled by a heavily armed and moderately attractive woman is surprising in its own right, what really caught us off guard was the fact that she was crying. See, we knew this guardswoman, both as a fellow passenger from the occurrence border and as one of the few survivors of a rather unsuccessful mission to purge some gene stealers. She was originally from some Nobby regiment and had one of those... 30 syllable names, but we called her Amy. Now, if any of us had been asked to describe Amy, we'd have used words like solid, professional, and dangerous. Never hysterical, or weepy, or inclined to hug random noncoms. I mean, it was a commonly held belief that she'd saluted her own mother every night before bed, which sort of made sense when you remembered that her mother was a Lord General. Anyway, the point is that her breakdown was terrifying more than anything. Sarge disentangled himself and, as politely as possible, asked Amy what the hell she was doing here. Last any of us had heard, her team had been farther towards Tau space and had been one of the ones to go MIA. Nubby chimed in and pointed out that everyone had thought she was dead. Twitch suggested that maybe she was, and asked Fumbles to check if she was a ghost. This triggered another round of hysterical giggling and got Twitch a hug of his own, which terrified the demolitions trooper. The reunion was brought to a halt when the tech priest rolled over to us with his servitor posse. In typical high-ranking cogboy fashion, he commanded everyone to shut up and take him to the shuttle. Our presence was not ideal, but could be made to serve the Omnissiah. This triggered another shift from hysterical to furious in Amy. This time we were in a better position to understand what was being said. The main thread of the argument seemed to be that the Majos had gotten everyone killed, refused to call for a pickup, and then gotten them stranded on an empty world for his bloody metal god. Amy was done serving the Omnissiah. For his part, the cogboy, who Sarge finally recognized as the Xenotech hunting Majos who'd been part of our expedition, turned his vocoder up to maximum volume and tried to counter each individual point. Why he was doing it was a mystery 
because everything he said just made Amy angrier and convinced us that the guy was a complete tool. The bullshit about how his mission couldn't be jeopardized by bringing in unbelievers, or how he was not responsible for the behavior of organics was bad enough. But the crowning moment of tooldom was when he pointed at three familiar-looking servitors and claimed that Amy's companions still retained the majority of bodily functions. That neatly answered the question of where the Arbite and clerics she'd been teamed up with had gotten to. Over the next few minutes, things degraded even further as Tink started needling the tech priest as well. Sarge was about ready to step in and end the shouting match one way or another when Tink saddled up next to him. In the quietest and calmest voice he could manage, Twitch told Sarge that these guys weren't the movement he'd spotted. And he was fairly sure we were being watched. He asked if we could, very casually, start falling back to a more defensible position. Sarge looked around at the floor-to-ceiling windows on three of the walls around us, and agreed that might be a good idea. Employing the entirety of his acting talent, Sarge announced that some fresh air might calm everyone down. Nubby took the hint and grabbed Amy, while Sarge tried to shivy the Majos out of the shop. When that didn't work, he just got behind the tech priest and started pushing him until he got the point. Twitch, trying to keep his head from swiveling like a nervous pigeon's, set his eyes on a sturdy-looking garage and led the way. Twitch casually gave a hand signal as he walked. Tink correctly interpreted this as an order to send out his stealth drone, and Fumbles got the point after Nubby kicked him in the shin. The psyker swayed a little and tripped over a curb, but when we hauled him to his feet, he shook his head and muttered about everything looking clear. At the back of the group, the shouting match continued, even though Amy's heart obviously wasn't in it anymore. She'd picked up on what was happening, and everyone could tell she was trying to hide the fact that she was terrified. The only people that were oblivious to the change in the atmosphere were the tech priests. The Majos had really started picking up steam now that Amy was distracted. He was loudly bad-mouthing just about everyone, and made it very hard to concentrate on looking casual. We'd reached the edge of the garage when Tink made a sort of high-pitched wheezing sound and went pale. Everyone took the hint and started power-walking towards the opening. Well, almost everyone. At the back of the group, the Majos and his servitors had come to a halt, and the tech priest was in full monologue mode. He stood there, stock still and surrounded by his herd of servitors, and loudly declared his genius, devotion, and general craziness to the rest of the world. As he entered the safety of the garage, Sarge glanced back at the Majos and then at Tink, who shook his head violently. Sarge sighed, grabbed a smoke grenade, and chucked it at the Majos' feet at the exact time the sniper fired. The shot was perfectly aimed. A nearly invisible laser beam came in at the Majos' eye level. Would have been a clean kill if he hadn't had a refractor shield. There was a blinding flash where the beam met the shield and the tech priest started screaming orders at his servitors. Now that the charade was over, Sarge asked for a sit rep as everyone got their weapons ready. Tink claimed that there were two hostiles wearing some sort of stealth suits and carrying rifles. Neither of them had line of sight inside the garage. Their stealth was damned good, so there were probably more he hadn't spotted. But they either couldn't hit us, or were all focusing on the Majos. Speaking of the Majos, he'd apparently decided not to come join us in our cover and had hunkered down in the smoke with his servitors. The six meat puppets had formed a sort of wall around him, and were firing an indiscriminate barrage into the surrounding area. Didn't look like they had any real idea of where the snipers were, and as we watched, two of the servitors went down to incredibly well-placed shots. Our desire to go out there and help him dropped sharply. 
all of us were familiar with sniper and counter-sniper tactics. Tink was told to continue sweeping for hostiles, and Fumbles was ordered to do likewise. The theory was that once we had their location, we could lay down suppressing fire or start flanking. Until we knew where all the snipers were, even if none of them had shot at us yet, we were effectively pinned. Unfortunately, something about these hostiles had Fumbles stumped. He could barely even locate the ones Tink had spotted. The little guy gritted his teeth and pumped up more psych into his detection field. But we all felt a wave of despair from him as he only succeeded in covering himself in a painful sheet of static electricity. Outside, another servitor dropped to a headshot, and the Majo started yelling at us to help him. It was officially time to either shit or get off the pot. At the current rate, the Majos was going to be dead before we had all of the snipers localized. The more pragmatic members of the squad pointed out that this wasn't such a bad thing, and suggested we just run for the shuttle while he drew fire. But Sarge vetoed this perfectly valid plan. At his order, everyone popped smoke and split out into two teams. Sarge, Amy, and Twitch pushed out and started laying suppressive fire and grenades onto the two rough locations Tink had given them. Tink, Nubby, and Fumbles went out to the back to try and flank the sniper between us and the shuttle. Meanwhile, Jim ordered his three skulls to help the drone search the area, warmed up the shuttle's perimeter defenses, and relayed the situation to the ship. Everything started out so well. The two snipers immediately stopped firing, Tink managed to spot a third and put a plasma bolt through the bastard's cover, and our flankers were almost in position. It was really looking like we were going to be able to neutralize the hostiles, or at least get to the Majos and start a nice orderly retreat. Then two things happened and everything went to shit. At first, we thought the psychers had popped smokes of their own and were falling back. The buildings they were holed up in went sort of hazy and vague, but the fog didn't drift, and a second later, the snipers resumed firing from inside the cloud. Another servitor went down, and Twitch's grenade detonated in mid-arc. Fumbles screamed, Psyker! at the exact same moment the laser cannon fired. Well, laser cannon isn't really the right word, but damned if we could think of a better one. A laser cannon typically fires a large, powerful, brief beam. This thing was barely larger than a multi-laser, and walked in a brief arc across the battlefield. It just sliced through everything it touched. Walls, lamp posts, the car Sarge was hiding behind, servitors, and tech priests. Sarge laid there for a second, trying to blink away the purple afterimages and get his bearings. He was lying on the ground and was also apparently inside of a car. He looked out a side window, which was oddly level with his head, and saw some sort of red and chrome spider monster flailing towards him. Sarge tried to turn his laser gun towards this new threat, but it was wedged against the roof of the car. He futilely pushed at the roof with his hands, then his legs, as the spider thing inched closer on its metal legs. At the last second, a pair of hair-thin beams stabbed into the spider and it fell to the ground. Sarge breathed a sigh of relief, which turned into a choked scream when something tightened across his throat. Twitch hauled Sarge out from the decapitated car by the collar. It was an impressive feat of strength, given their relative sizes and the unhelpful way the big man was flailing around. The servitors were scragged, those last sniper shots seemed to have finished off the cog boy, and there was no telling what the psyker or lace cannon would do next. In his professional opinion, it was time to live to fight another day. Twitch hit Sarge with his emergency stim while Amy popped her last smoke. Under its cover, they half-carried Sarge back to the relative safety of the garage. Once inside, Amy kept her long las trained on the smoke-filled entrance, while Twitch tried to fill everyone in on the situation. 
Before he got two words out, the laser cannon cut through the entire building at shoulder height. The flanking team was having better luck, all things considered. Jim's skulls were hounding the sniper. Tank had flushed out, and Fumbles had a rough bead on the enemy psyker. Tink sent his drone to get the exact position and charged up his plasma gun, while Nubby and Fumbles poured laser fire and psychic shrieks into the clouds, concealing the two active snipers. Their accuracy was abysmal, but the angle of their attack and the sheer volume of fire was enough to force the hostiles to rebase. None of them realized how bad the situation had gotten until they heard Twitch's warning get cut off by a second laser cannon strike. In an uncharacteristic act of bravery, Nubby led the charge back towards the garage, taking Fumbles with him and leaving Tink on overwatch. Jim diverted his Metascull to follow them, then sent the rest of his minions to find the laser cannon before it could fire again. They found the building teetering alarmingly, but still upright, and with Sarge standing in the middle, barking at the other two troopers to get back on their feet. Back in the garage, Sarge was dealing with a minor mutiny. He was of the opinion that the Majos was still alive and a pickup needed to be made. Twitch and Amy disagreed. Nubby got to the door just in time to hear the non-com shout that the Majos was still moving and could be saved if they hurried. Amy countered his argument by hefting her long lays and putting a hot shot through the head of the twitching tech priest. Further debate was delayed by the roof caving in. There's nothing like a few tons of collapsing stone to motivate a hasty retreat. Nubby, as usual, led our sprint back to Twitch's position with a stimmed-up Sarge hard on his heels, and the rest of the group trailing behind. None of us even registered Jim's question over the comms. As we regrouped, Tink's drone finally found his target. A large blob of overcharged plasma sailed across the plaza and into a tasteful little restaurant. Instead of just burning through the building, it splashed against something in the back with a loud, crackling explosion. Tink cheered, then swore, then yelled something about tackle, and burst into laughter. Twitch barely managed to pull him down in time. The sniper's shot cut a neat little notch out of the techie's helmet. None of us wanted to start this shit again. Fumbles threw up a half-assed cloak, and we all started falling back towards the shuttle in pairs. Now that we knew what to look for, we could see three indistinct blurs poking in and out of cover. We did our best to return fire as we ran, but the buggers had nerves of steel. For every ten shots we put down range, they returned one incredibly well-aimed one. Only the combination of our cover... Fumble's cloak and a massive amount of suppressive fire kept us alive. That's not to say we got out of there unscathed. Those hair-thin laser bolts nailed everyone at least once. If you stuck a toe outside a cover, they'd shoot it. And if you didn't, they'd try to punch a shot right through. The only one of us who managed to score a hit on them was Amy and the second time she tried to line up a shot, her long lays exploded in her hands as they put a shot down the barrel. Stopping and waiting for Jim's Metascull, which had gone Emperor Nosewear during the retreat, was out of the question, so Sarge wound up popping another stim and carrying her for the last sprint to the shuttle. We all felt tremendous relief when the shuttle's multi-lasers finally forced the snipers to back off. As we reached the top of the shuttle's loading ramp, Twitch asked if anyone knew what had happened to the laser cannon. Right on cue, a section of bulkhead started glowing, then the damned beam punched through with a spray of molten metal. Jim didn't bother waiting for an order. The engines roared to life and our big, ungainly shuttle started to wallow upwards. As the rear ramp began to close, the laser cannon fired again, and neatly burned through its hydraulics. Everyone resisted the urge to go poke their heads out the broken door and see what was shooting those beams at us. At this point, Tank, who'd been rather focused on not getting shot like the rest of us, realized that someone was missing. 
he yanked the drone controller off of his harness and started screaming at Jim to slow down. Jim correctly interpreted this as a terrible idea and ignored it. Everyone who wasn't collapsing from blood loss or stim after effects was watching as the techie frantically slammed at the drone's controls and screamed curses. The show was briefly interrupted when the las cannon burned through the floor about a meter in front of Tink's feet, but resumed after a few evasive maneuvers slammed us around like pinballs. It didn't take a savant to see that Tink was losing his race. Spot the Wonder Drone was great at stealth and recon, but it just wasn't built for this sort of speed. Nubby clumped over to put a hand on the techie's shoulder. He suggested that maybe Tink should park the drone somewhere. We'd be able to come back and get it in a few years. Tink whirled around and had his drone controller raised like a club when the lace cannon fired again. The shuttle pissed forward as the tail of the vessel exploded in a fireball. The difference in attitude between Tink and the rest of us when the laser cannon took out our tail engine was profound. While everyone else screamed, clutched the safety handles, or prayed for the Emperor, he let out a whoop of joy and ran to the jammed ramp. A few sniper beams sailed past him and were ignored in favor of a small tan shape, which, now that our speed had been cut in half, was steadily growing larger. Tink cooed at the damn thing like a puppy, which was admittedly better than a girlfriend, but still. As it closed in the last few dozen meters, he spread his arms wide and tried to catch it, only to get knocked off his feet as a smaller and faster object sailed through. The drone followed a second later and slammed into Twitch, who'd been holding on for dear life in a far corner. Tink sat up and groped at the object that had knocked him on his ass. He raised two blood-covered hands, registered that he was holding a severed head attached to a metaskull, and started screaming. Jim appeared in the hatch leading to the cockpit and asked if the Majos had made it aboard. The cogboy barely managed to wrench the gory thing away from Tink before it was chucked back out the tail hatch. Jim held the Majos' head up like some sort of trophy, and turned to face Sarge with a rather proud expression on his face. Unfortunately, our barely conscious leader wasn't able to offer any suitable praise. All he managed was a bleary, who's flying the shuttle? Jim swore and ran back into the cockpit, barely managing to dodge the next laser cannon beam, Thankfully, that was the last shot. Everyone breathed a sigh of relief and slumped into their seats. Well, more a gasp of relief. We were all pretty out of breath and our ears were hurting for some reason. Tink eyed the holes in the cargo bay and kicked the rest of us to our feet. We wound up packing seven people, and for some damn reason, the drone, into the two-man cockpit. It wasn't comfortable, but at least there was air. Between all the sweating, bleeding people, the Majos' severed head, and Nubby's uniquely indescribable odor, that cockpit was getting pretty manky by the time we reached the occurrence border. As soon as the bay was pressurized, we piled out and collapsed on the first available surface. The ship's air, which smelled faintly of burnt cabbage, had never tasted so sweet. 